What's up, guys? Scott Bartlett here from Saving Able and Grind Lifestyle. On today's podcast, we have an old friend of mine, old musician friend of mine, Mr. Paul McCoy from the band 12 Stones. What's up? What's up, gentlemen? What's up? Paul, what up, dude? How are you, buddy? I'm doing wonderful. Hey, can I just say that the live that you guys did on YouTube and Facebook together uh, covering one of the 12 Stone songs and then obviously Addicted by Saving Abel with, uh, with Scott was freaking phenomenal. Right on, man. Thank pretty you. Good, pretty yeah, good. Those, yeah, those two versions of the songs. Oh, my God. Like, wow. So good. Pretty, uh, it, pretty makes good. Me, um, it makes me think about, uh, not to, I mean, let's, let's just jump right into it. Obviously, we're doing this tour together. Given the archaic audio and video that we had, just trying to piece it together, um, like we talked about earlier, we're not necessarily IT guys. We are musicians first and foremost. If we could make it sound like that with the gear we had, I cannot wait to hear what this tour has in store for everybody. So the next purchase that Grind Lifestyle is going to make for Mr. Scott Bartlett is going to be a set of these. And these yes. right here will solve all of your problems. And so we're going to, uh, we are not sponsored by Rode, but if Rode would like to sponsor us, reach out. Nick or I'd be happy <laughs> to, uh, to be endorsed by Road. Um, no, it, it turned out terrific. I mean, the iPhone footage that uh, that Paul had and then the YouTube stuff, and I know that there were some technical difficulties going into it, it turned out really, really good. So if you guys haven't had an opportunity to go see it, you can go to Scott Bartlett's. Go check <laughs> out Scott Bartlett's YouTube at Scott Bartlett Official. We are 95 people away from 1,000, which will get us to jump in that next algorithm set for Scott Help him grow his channel. Make sure you go check out Paul's as well. He's got two YouTube channels right now. We're going to do our best yeah. to get that merged into one. <laughs> so go hit a like and subscribe. Make sure you do that like and subscribe thing here. Enough of the bullshit. You guys looking forward to go July 11th, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, July 11th is the first date. Mm -hmm. So tell us, uh, tell us about the tour. Tell us what the fans can expect. I mean, I know that we're going to have some covers. I know that there's going to be some Saving Abel stuff. I know there's going to be some 12 Stone stuff. Well, let's back up a little bit. This is like Paul's first time out in, what, seven years? Yeah. So, yeah, that's, yeah. Where, that, that's where I was going. It's like, you yeah. know, Paul, Paul's been on quite the journey. We're going to dig into that on this episode. We do got an hour to talk here if we need it. Um, how, are you nervous? You excited? Uh, a little bit of both, honestly. I, I, my nerves are bad just because um, the time away from live performance, but also the lifestyle away from uh, live performance. So the last few times I was able to perform live, I uh, I had quite the crutch. You know what I mean? I was uh, in the bottle pretty heavy am amongst uh, other things. And uh, so the, the handful of shows I've done sober have been uh, – hard it's been like i'm easily distracted by things in the audience whereas before i just had a, a spiel in between every song i had a autopilot that was pretty legendary and uh now i i i'm such a chronic overthinker that i'll be on stage looking at somebody having a conversation and i'm trying to read lips and remember words and now so you know <laughs> I, i'm just my brain is my own worst enemy a lot of times but uh i i'm, I'm trying to use the nerves for good so i i the night after we did that live, because we had so much technical issues, I just hopped on by myself the following night. And I was just telling everybody on that live, I was like, you know, one of my biggest fears in the world is playing guitar and singing at the same time. I'm, my brain's just not wired that way. And I, I just get panic mode sometimes. So I was like, the only way to beat this fear is to just do it. So here, uh, taking requests. And I just started playing oh, snippets of our, our songs and hack my way through some of them, but it helped me relinquish some of that stress and some of that anxiety. So for me, going to a live performance, I never expect perfection because that, you know, the human element is it's never going to sound the same way, right? There's always going to be something that's a little different, whether it be a pacing thing or whether it be engineering's a little off or the venue is a little echoey or whatever the situation may be. It's never going to sound the same. I'm excited. I'm a live guy. So for me, you know, a lot of a lot of cutting my teeth came from like jam bands, like Almond Brothers kind of stuff. So as a lead guitar player, I'm always deviating from whatever it is I'm supposed to do. You know, with Saving Abel, we have this epic song called Drowning Face Down, and there's a 35-second guitar solo. Like the stuff like that, I have to stay close to home. 
but I'm most comfortable in my element deviating just a little bit and reading the room. And like, you know, with regards to what Paul just said about playing and singing, you know, it, it, it's funny, that's never been an issue for me necessarily, but little things that I have to overcome, like he suggested a song the other night to me via text, and I'm not going to tell you what it is, but it's a cover song that we're going to attempt to play, I think, on this run. And it involves slide guitar, which I can do all day in the studio and I can do all day at home or in front of friends. In front of people is just something I've never done. So I figure if Paul's going to take some chances, I'm just going to take some chances. And y'all are going to watch it unfold in real time. I like it. So I'm kind of insulted, Bartlett. Uh-oh. Why aren't you giving us the uh, the lowdown? Why aren't you telling the fans right now what this surprise is going to be? Why are you making them wait until July 11th? Just let the faithful know. Well, full disclosure, it's not like we've rehearsed said song. He just sent it over to me and he said, do you know it? And I was like, yeah, everybody knows it. Um, and then you don't have to tell. Like, I'm just baiting you. I'm just it's, baiting uh, you. I know. It's, dude, it's, it's hit me, baby, one more time. Britney Spears. It's You guys, you're going to kill it. It's good. Let's move on. I, I thought <laughs> it was going to be Wrecking Ball by Miley Cyrus. <laughs> I, I suggested, ask Paul, it's true. I suggested Waterfalls by TLC. He did. He did indeed. <laughs> did you tell him no, Paul? I, I just I just uh, leaned them in directions of other options, you know. I, Let's just see what's happening, dude. There. If you guys are gonna do a TLC waterfalls, do I want to sex you up, color me bad? I mean, I mean, a, a rock point, acoustic version of that would be kind of kick ass. You guys jump out, and do the dance moves. Yeah, I mean, at this point, we might as well just. It's gonna go viral. I mean, Millie Vanilli tribute <laughs> act and just you know, <laughs> keep that going. I'm with it. <laughs> So uh, can we dive into your history a little bit? You said, you know, 12 Stones, pretty successful, you know, several years. Um, you admitted that you had a problem. Now you are in control of of the issues that you've had. What was that final step? What made you decide that, you know what, I need to do this differently? Uh, there are a lot of factors. Um, I know that I'm wired to go 100 miles an hour head first into a wall. Uh, I'm like a human Roomba in in uh, trial and error type issues in my life where if there's something I like, I I do it till it can't be done anymore. If, I, if there's something that it, it could be something as simple as a, a TV show. If I get into it, I'm watching the whole series in three days. I'm not turning it off and I'm just I hyper focus on things. So I realized that the longer it went for me, it started out as just being a way to uh, break the ice or a way to just settle the nerves just a little bit. Because no matter what anybody tells you, I love performing. I love being on the stage with the, with the guys and 12 Stones and, and going full blast, full volume. I love that. But I always had nerves. It didn't matter uh, if it was five people or 5,000 people. It didn't matter. The nerves are there. I always put my headphones in and run around and know. Uh, do all that so i started where i would have a drink an hour before we play we gave ourselves a rule it's like no no drinking four shows that's how it initially started and then it was like well we'll have a drink an hour before just to kind of get the nerves in check and then it was like the hour before became the starting line where it was like okay 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 and go and then it was how much can you drink in the that. hour leading up to the show <laughs> and then it was that leads into during the show me talking a lot of trash on the microphone, people buying your shots, then feeling a sense of like camaraderie, inability to say no. Not that I would have or wanted to anyway at that point, but free drinks are free drinks. Then after the show, I love interacting and meeting people. So I would change up, run out in the crowd, hang out in the venue with everybody, do more shots, more drinks. And then it was a rinse repeat. So it just became to where my tolerance got to just an unhealthy level. And I did that for lots of years. And then it just progressively got worse where it took more and more where there was no hour before it was, I'm just up, I'm doing it. You know, Scott and I have done a lot of tours together with our, our bands respectively. And he can tell you firsthand that uh, I'm a much different human being right now than I was uh, seven years ago. So, um, you know, I realized I just had to, I just had to be honest with myself. You know, I'm, I'm stubborn. Uh, I tried AA. I tried other things. It didn't work for me. It's not. I don't feel that that is necessarily for everyone. 
I'm already such a chronic overthinker that I have to be in control of the scenario. So if I'm in a room with a whole bunch of people chanting and stuff, I, it, it makes me more self-conscious and it just, it did the opposite for me. So I just had to make a decision to be done. And, uh, I don't, I don't have a medium. I don't have a number two setting. I, I'm like on or off and, uh, and that's with anything. So I feel like the options were jail, dead, or sober. So I made the decision to keep on staying above ground. Kudos oh, to you. Awesome. Kudos to you. So hey, uh, you know, I follow you on social media. We're friends, social media now. Thanks for the uh, thanks for the ad there. One thing that kind of struck me as we're getting to know each other a little bit, you seem like you're into the other arts as well. I see that you were getting ready to ship some uh, some artwork out. Tell us about the art. Yeah, um, honestly, I had a I had a health scare a couple months back where uh, I was working 50, 60 hour weeks at a restaurant, and uh, I, I enjoy I enjoy anything that's creative, anything that in, uh, lets me be creative. So, if it comes to restaurants, I love making food. I love seeing empty plates come back. I love the chaos that's riding right on the edge of trying to get people food, you know, good food fast. And it's like, I love riding on the edge of that chaos. So I found out I had a health scare and uh, I found out I had melanoma, which I had like a big old, uh, oh yeah, big old chunk cut out. But uh, uh, that, that made me realize like, you know, I'm, I'm 42 now. I've, I've been very blessed in my life to uh, get to travel the world, play music, and do things with some of my best friends. And uh, I just realized I was, settling into a place of complacency and being okay with just being okay. So I just decided that I didn't want to, I didn't want to work for somebody else anymore. So I was like, you know what? Well, how do we, how do we rectify this? Like I'm a broke musician. So I was working at, I had an, I mean, the job I was working, I liked everybody I worked with. It's a restaurant. I, I'm, I, I'm good in that environment, but I just realized that like, I felt like I was wasting away, you know? So I just decided I'm going to quit my job and uh, play some music and see what happens. So I did that and uh, I just started painting for like therapeutic reasons and posted a couple up and people were like, whoa, what's that? And they're like, I didn't know you could draw. I'm like, I didn't either. You know, I'm like, this is just ways for me to kind of put, put another creative outlet out there. So I just started slinging paint on canvas. You can just kind of see some of them back here uh, behind mm -hmm. me, but yeah, I uh, love the lie to me right there. It's uh, it keeps sticking my sticking to my eye. I'm like, damn, that thing looked really good hanging on my wall. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, so yeah, I, and the thing is, I like I I'm able to just vent some of these frustrations that life throws at all of us. You know, no one's immune to daily struggles, and you know, me being sober now doesn't actually. It's not like it's just like oh, I did it. I I'm sober, and that's just you know, it's a daily. It's a daily thing you have to go through. So I use I use painting. I use uh, my guitars here. I use my little home studio to just kind of the same way that I would have used the drugs and the alcohol. It's, I use that as my a way to escape and and just relax That's and blow cool. off steam. Much more like than that. Do you yeah. uh do you have a favorite piece? I uh, yeah. Um, I'll be honest with you. I didn't know that people were going to be as responsive as they were to this idea. So I'm selling through them fast and uh, it's, it's been a weird, it's been a bittersweet moment because like I, I didn't really paint these to sell them initially. And uh, some of them, I was like, man, I like, I like that one. I, I want it in my house, <laughs> but you know, and I, I'm not in a position to really replicate ideas. It's kind of like a, everything's a one of one, whatever. I, I, so I try to replicate a few, but uh, let's see, I got a, this one. This one's titled after our song "Anywhere But Here," and uh, all of them are like uh, 3D in a sense. So, like yeah. this, this oh, the cloud is actually it'll catch shadows from lights depending on where it hits. Uh, as a separate canvas burned, uh, lighter burned, and just made mm -hmm. a dark cloud. So this one's "Anywhere But Here," kind of a cool one. I know. I bet it's a, it's a lot of the nostalgia stuff too. Like Twelve Stones. I mean, for me. I was telling Scott, I think I even told you, like, you're like one of the bucket list artists that I wanted to work with. And like when Scott brought up the idea, I'm like, holy crap, dude, Paul from 12 Stones. That's, that's amazing. The song Stay that was in Butterfly Effect was like one of my favorite songs of all time. 
Right and on. I'm like, holy shit, this is so cool. So I think it's a, a lot of it is like the nostalgia effect too of like, you guys were a huge, huge rock band. You had, you did the vocals on that Evanescence song. That's one of the biggest songs in rock and roll. And like, you just bring back good memories for people. And yeah, actually, you probably we, bring back the memories too. We, we were talking about it um, with regards to just like longevity and timelines. And I mean, again, Paul and I have known each other so long. And I think back on my career and my tenure as like a Memphis musician and a Memphis staple kind of studio guy and a live guy, I didn't get, I had four bad record deals before Saving Abel. And mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm four years older than Paul. I'm four years older than Paul, but Paul got his keys to the kingdom younger than me. I was 27. Paul was 19 when they got discovered. And so he's just got this wealth of years and like his... His timeline is different than mine because I don't care who you are. You're a different man when you're 19 than when you're 27. So the stories he can be telling through his art are what kind of fascinate me because although we lived a similar journey, it's it's different in many ways too. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Absolutely. So what do you you know, Paul Paul Scott Paul told us you know that that this is kind of his getaway, his stress relief, his meditation. I uh, we all know that you know you just told me before this you're down about 40 pounds. You said. Yeah. Oh, I saw that picture that I sent you guys. And it's, you know how it is like the day to day, you can't see it. And it's just frustrating. You're in your forties. You're like, man, I ate a piece of bread and gained 16 pounds. What the hell? Right? <laughs> and, uh, but when you see those pictures from like months ago, it's just, it's night and day. And uh, yeah, for me, a big release lately has been just getting to the gym. I talk about it a lot. I saw that, that Arnold thing, like, just don't think about it. Just go. Mm -hmm. And I feel infinitely better when I just go there and I, I try not to think about anything. Like I just zone out. Do you, do you have anything else outside of working out though that you do that's that's kind of kind of yours? I mean, I'm obviously different industry for me. Nick's kind of a hybrid, does everything. And we'll ask Nick the same thing, but outside of the gym, what do you do to uh what do you do to decompress? I started something brand new last night. And so and I and I'm embarrassed to say what it is, but I'd love for you to tell me what else you do outside well, of the so, gym that relieves some stress i'm sort of blessed i, I learned it from my dad who was a, a major heavyweight in academic science and he loved what he did he was the chief of infectious diseases at johns hopkins hospital for 30 years but he loved what he did so he just always said that was his release was work for me i don't that apple doesn't fall far from the tree because of how i learned it it's music that's why so i went to rhodes college in memphis tennessee very reputable school, reputable business school. And I was a business major. Halfway through it, I just said, screw this. I don't want to sit behind a desk. Like, I am going to play music. I'll still have a, a business degree. But music is my thing, man. I mean, when, when, when I kick my shoes off at night, I pick up a guitar. I listen to an old song. I might come up with some random idea. Like, that is my artistic release. You would think, you know, for me, you would think hand-eye coordination is good. Baseball coach forever, right? Played baseball my entire life, can hit, type 110 words a minute with a 99% accuracy rate on a keyboard. You would think with my my hand-eye coordination that I might have some musical talent when it comes to playing an instrument. I don't know if I told you or not, but my dad went to school to become a, a music instructor, played 11 different instruments. He was phenomenal. I've tried to teach myself to play guitar no exaggeration, probably 25 times. And I've quit 25 times because I'm fucking horrible at it. I, you know, I just I cannot do it. So for me, you know, it's I can't go do the social media thing because I do it for a living. I don't want to get online and go look at websites because I build those for a living. So when I look at a website, I'm seeing the back end. How's it functioning? How's it working? When I see right. something on social media, I'm seeing the analytic end. Is it Even if it's not my stuff, is this good? Is this bad? What are the trends staying? So when I'm doing that for a living, that's the last thing I want to do. So what did I do? I downloaded Farm Simulator 2022 last night. Uh, <laughs> right on. Right on. And literally, Farm Simulator, farm simulator you, it's like Farmville, but pc based and i literally started at eight o'clock last night and went to bed at three o'clock this morning after i planted my crops and so it's <laughs> priority man priority. absolutely horrible so embarrassed to it's say different dude i mean it's different it's cool i mean 
look at this stage in our lives. Different is cool, man. Don't don't worry about that. So I'm yeah, hoping I'm not sure the only one running around be playing Pokemon, dude. Like, yeah, well, that's J that's JP. JP tried to get me on Pokemon. Yeah. I played that no, for dude. a day, and I'm like, no. I'm surprised like those people are still alive. Like you're looking at your phone, you're walking around town. You're like, I literally see 15 people walk out in front of cars every day. It's like, the hell are you looking for? Pokemon, dude, you're fucking 35 years old. <laughs> so, what, what so, what, so what do you do besides collect shoes and hats <laughs> and grind your ass off? What in work? What does Nick Martin do for stress relief? Do not say workout. Because we're the, the, the gym one. is my number one go-to for sure, hundred percent. Like I go twice a day now. I, I mean, you look at Bartlett's arms, like, dude, <laughs> I got, I got to get there. <laughs> so, yeah, twice a day doing that. Um, other than that, it's it's basically just like hanging out with my kids. That's like, it's stressful, but it's also like you're like kind of the coolest, kind of the coolest thing seeing their little personalities of like. And the shit talking back and forth makes right, me less lame. Well, yeah. one thing, one thing also, <laughs> I think that we can all agree on is that we've all sort of come into this union where you know merchandising is fun. Yes, coming up with different ideas for me, it's always been, and and, and I should have mentioned that too because I, I spend a lot of time. Paul remembers my clothing line on tour. He was just like, "Yeah, dude, you you brand everything is ridiculous. You just, yeah. just I, I always think ideas." Because my merch is centered around my tattoos. So it's like I want the garment or whatever the object is to not just be a replica of the tattoo, but tell the story of what it means to me and why I ended up getting it. And that put, takes me through a lot of hoops as to how to tell that story with one piece of anything. Um, and I, I spent a lot of time on that. Actually, these last few days, I got two new designs coming out that I'm pretty excited about. I'm going to incorporate that rock horn tattoo into the uh, into the bridge, Paul. You know that bridge going from Arkansas into Memphis. Yeah, yeah, Over Mud Island. Yeah, Mud Island, and it's just going to say, "I'm going to invert the rock horn this way, so it'll be the M, and it's just going to say Memphis." Ooh, oh yeah, you you were you were telling me that while you were here. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Yeah, I, I so, sent Scott an idea for a shirt right before the podcast. He shot it down. So I, 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 oh, I, uh, with, <laughs> I have hey. Bartlett would have gone. Forty year old Bartlett says no. <laughs> so I'm sending you both the text. I actually have a design, and this will be the first one that I want to roll out. And I've approved everything that we've done, but there's actually one that I really like. Uh, needs to be tweaked a little bit. But check this one out. You guys check your phone real quick. Don't show it, but check your phone. I'm using my phone to do this, so I'll have to check it later. Something similar to that, Nicholas. Ooh, yeah. I like that. Isn't that nice? Yeah. See, now Scott's wondering. Well, I'm wondering. I'm all sure. Well, and also, you know, Paul's been working on his merch and trying to, you know, tie the room together with the painting. I told him it'd be a good idea to put one of the, his favorite paintings on a shirt. Oh, yeah. sort of well, you know? dude, the lie to me piece that you have up right there on a black background yeah sell immediately yeah that one would be sick <laughs> yep the smiley face one on the bottom mm -hmm. i like that one oh. yeah you digitize that put it on a it's shirt like it's a marker's no beauties you know yeah like, you know don't overbid don't underbid we're just gonna no, i'm just checking hey so <laughs> paul do you have an iphone yeah. Take as clear a picture as you can of that with your iPhone. Text it to me. I'll digitize it for you and kick it back. Oh, yeah. I, I honestly, I, I just did one of my prints. Uh, it's not in here, but it's a really cool uh, bloody smiley face uh, for our song, This Dark Day. I scribbled the lyrics and like uh, a white, and I threw a bunch of blood on it and then uh, took yes. a 3D scary bloody smiley face and affixed it to the top. And, uh, I, I came in here to try to get, I borrowed my sister's awesome camera and took some really good pictures of it. And then my, uh, my instant gratification kicked in and I ordered a, a print, two full size prints and a coffee mug. So I, I, yeah, <laughs> that should be here Saturday. Nice. We'll see what happens. Yeah. I'm, I'm just one of the, I, I'm like, I want to see it right now. Jamie's like, it was just, there's a place across the lake. You used Vista print, didn't you? Yeah, dude. 
I did. Yeah, I know. You did. If, if you're getting three day turnaround showing up on a yeah. Saturday, yeah, yeah, dude. I'm sad, dude. I'm I'm a sad man. I'm I'm a simple, <laughs> simple sad man, dude. I'm like, oh, what's that? Oh, cool, coffee mug. I like coffee. <laughs> that dude there, the I can put my own picture help. on the coffee. You mug. need a magnet? Here, here, have a magnet. <laughs> yeah, they caught me on the way to the cart too, because I was just gonna get the prints. I just wanted to get a sample to make sure the colors translated so I can have some of these prints of paintings because not everybody's going to want to have the ability to buy a full painting. Uh, but, you know, I try to get some prints done. That's the other thing is I think what we talked about, and I mentioned this to Scott, I think when we do this uh, acoustic tour, I'm planning on doing a painting on site at each show. Like when the doors open, I'm just going to set up somewhere, uh, sling some paint, shake some hands, have some conversation. And then just maybe do a raffle for the painting. So you know, you know it's authentic. It'll be one of one. It'll be each show will have its own little its own little thing, and then we'll raffle it off at the end of the night or something yeah. like that. I handle all Scott, I handle all Scott's scheduling for social media stuff. Nick does a bunch of the creation. We do some creation stuff in here as well. We kind of split those duties. But we uh between Nick and I, we we manage the Bartlett channels as far as you know when things go out and in guiding and consulting with Scott and Scott and Nick don't know yet, but I uh, I have a to-do list for every event that's going to be emailed to them this weekend. And I'm going to turn my phone off and not let Scott call me for a couple of days because he's not going to be happy about it. But the demands are high. So yeah. lots, lots, lots of content when you guys are on the road for this one. I'm, not yeah, I'm, I'm looking. I yeah, I'm able... Just for that reason. So we don't have to be driving the whole time. We could be filming. Yep. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, like... 30 seconds before you walk on stage, a live saying, walking on stage, Youngsville, Louisiana, right now, and then have it show, you know, your camera as you're walking on and then hit end. It's that type of stuff. So your, your demand is going to be a little higher. I like a little squad coming out, too, that can help us get content, you know. Um, yeah, we're, got, we're, we're gonna we're gonna bend the trends a little bit. We're gonna do things our own way, and we're uh, we're gonna maximize the views that we can on all channels. And we'll make sure that we tag you and everything we do. And and obviously we'll collab and everything that we create here. You can redistribute as well. Don't have. I've been kind of I've been uh, jumping on y'all's coattails as far as post trends and. Uh... Hey, so look at you know. If, hey, if you guys didn't know, and I'm not sure if it's on Paul's website yet or Twelve Stones, but it is on Scott Bartlett's website. You can go check out the tour dates and locations at scottbartlettcreations.com. It is front and center on his webpage. There, you can also go check out either the Grind Lifestyle uh, social media platforms or the Lifted Management platforms or Scott Bartlett social media. You go check it out there. As soon as we have ticket availability, ticket, I'll tickets go on sale July fifth. Friday, yeah. July 5th. And we'll have those links as they come up on the website. You'll be able to purchase those straight through scottbartlettcreations.com. Um, man, I hope you bring some honey for your throat, son. And I don't mean that in a perverted way, but <laughs> I, uh, I'm looking at this July 11th, July 13th, July 14th, and then a 10-day break, the 24th, and then 25th, and 27th, and then in a few days, and then August 9th, 10th, 16th, 17th, 18th. 29th, 14th of September, 15th of September. Oh, and there's more dates coming. And uh, we're, still, we're still stacking them up, too. So yeah. we're going. Scott, was, you wanted to get back to, get to play alive, buddy. Here we go. <laughs> well, that's what I said, man. I'll tell y'all, I'm a head first into the wall kind of man. So we go. So let me uh, ask you this. If this, uh, if this goes it. good and you're having fun, is there a chance that you'll get 12 stones back together and do like a, a full band run? Man, I'll be honest with you. I was talking to uh, John. John, for those who don't know, John Rodriguez is a 12 Stones rhythm guitar player. He's going to be out on this run uh, in full support of us and just That's just right. a great human being. Just love him to death. But uh, I, I've been speaking with him about seeing how this goes. Uh, okay. You know, this is going to be a new experience for, for me in a lot of ways. Um, I haven't been out in years, obviously. This time I'm bringing my fiance. I'm bringing my dogs, which I've got one on me right here. But I, I literally I'm I'm bringing home with me, so that way oh. you know it'd be hard to miss home when I when I got it uh, oh, on my only, hip while I'm out there. Not only does this appear to be you know work for you because it is, but more importantly, this seems to be a mountain that you want to climb. Seems like you're wanting to get yourself back on the, you know, back on the saddle and and go give it another go. Which, dude, we we are in full support of. 
I appreciate what? it. You know, I think yeah. I'm at a point now where I realize that, uh, like I said, it was, what's the point of quitting a salary job to jump off the deep end if you're not going to jump? You know, so uh, exactly. it was no, it was a no looking back kind of moment for me where I, I have to make some concessions and, and some obvious um, uh, hard decisions as we go through it all. But I mean, I don't see why if this goes well that we can't do at least some some solid festivals um end of the year early next year you know I, i'm i'm not i'm not shutting it down you know the only reason we haven't really toured is that life man we all we all grew older and kind of lived in different areas and and just had different paths in life and a lot of people all the time are just like man you gotta you gotta make up and, and get the band i'm like we're good, man. We don't we don't talk every day like we should all the time. But man, I've got nothing but love for any guy that's ever stepped stage or step foot on stage with me. Um, I, I I've got a place in my heart. I have nothing but love for for Eric Weaver and, and all the guys, and I try to talk to him as much as I can. Um, but man, you know it's a brotherhood when you're out there. So I think that's I've the craziest never... misconception that people have too when bands go on hiatus. It's yeah. not because they're fighting. It's just because everybody grew up and life happened and kids, families, whatever. And then time just goes so fast now. Like the older we get, it's just like a year goes by super, super fast. And then all of a sudden it's like 10 years later. You're like, oh, shit. Right. right. Well, that was, I mean, I saw Paul, you know, I was on Facebook and I saw he had that scare and he knew I had a scare. He was out on tour with me on Make America Rock. When I almost died. Um. And, you know, I, I read that and I was like, this is the universe telling me to hit him up right now. And I'm glad I did because it's, it's Paul McCoy. He probably got a billion requests after that. But I was I was first to the table because I was ready to I, eat. <laughs> I don't answer my phone, bro. I don't answer my phone to anybody. So I'm glad I'm glad I was able to you know, and respond to you in a, in a timely fashion, because I'll be honest with you, even. Like I know Noel reached out a while back and I was just not in a position to do anything. And I, and I'm always humbled by the the request and like people wanting to, to uh, do stuff, but I just wasn't in a position in my life to uh, abandon the mission, you know, just yet. Whereas like I still have so much I need to accomplish on a personal level before I can feel comfortable uh, getting back out into a place uh, that to be honest with you, I mean, that environment is very detrimental to a lot of people in my position where it's like same with working in a restaurant, you know, trying to be sober working in the kitchen is crazy. Dude. Crazy. It's yeah. In, it's insane, man. And, and I don't, I'm not saying that to slight anybody. I mean, I love being the captain of the Isle of the Misfit toys, dude. I'm like, you run running, you're on my ship. We're having a good time, but every environment I tend to put myself in is just, a beehive it seems where i'm just like standing there like oh this is going to go one of two ways and it's going to be awesome either way but uh we're about to find out what i'm made of in these decision making times so i'm looking forward to the challenge of getting out and uh just seeing people again um i think with my sobriety has come a lot more social awkwardness scott and i talked about this uh while he was down here but like i don't know what to do with my hands you know what i'm saying i don't I, I I don't know how to people very much anymore. Uh, in the sense, we went, to dinner. I get we went to dinner and I was like talking to the hostess, and I just had to turn to Paul and go, "Did I handle that like a normal person, or was I like a really weird human being just then?" And he's like, "No, you were fine." And I was like, "Do you ever get social anxiety?" And he stares through me and he goes, "Crippling." <laughs> yeah. It's. And I, and it's easier now to look back and go, okay, that's why I drank and did all the things because it it made me loosen up and go, all right, now I get to be that character that I create right. to perform, you know. And people didn't realize that there was a separation between me, the person that you know goes to work at the restaurants and does this, and then they see the performer side, and then they don't realize that it's two two separate entities. So back when I was partying and drinking all the time, that character that I created ended up taking over i right. had to always be on there was never i was never allowed to have a non-crazy day i was known at least you know in the tighter circles as just being a lunatic that would do whatever it took to perform and, and do the show uh I, nobody was going to out drink me nobody was going to out party me no one was going to out fund me and i had to i had to keep that up 
And it got to the point where even when I was home, I couldn't turn that off where I would be, you know, I'd come home and just be like, all right, what, what, what are we doing? Like, what, you know, I want to go do this. And I'm like, dude, it is 2 PM on a Tuesday. And you, you, you already like wearing swim trunks, talking about flying to California and doing like, <laughs> I, I don't have an off switch. So, you know, having to learn how to be like a normal, being okay with being like a normal human being and not relying on this made up psychopathic character that performed, you know, and is the, the dichotomy of like, I was in this band that a lot of people unknowingly considered a Christian band, but then I was on the other side of the coin. I'm like, have you ever even been to a 12 stone show? Like, so I'm going to jump, gonna jump in on that Christian band thing. So being a concert promoter for like over 20 years, I started out working with only Christian bands. I can tell you right now, they drink and do more drugs than any secular band I have ever worked with in my life. Okay, one um, second. I, uh, cut Nick out at <laughs> eleven. I'm not. I'm not going to say which bands they are. They're like very, I'll, very, very big Christian bands. Yeah, I won't and either. It's like holy crap. Well, I, I mean, and, and a I lot mean, of this I'm, partying happened in churches. I'm going to try to stay somewhat politically correct, but in my younger days. Preacher's daughters are the ones that I was going after. Yeah. <laughs> so it's. We always got it too, man. I mean, look, my band is called Saving Abel. Like, it doesn't get much more biblical than that. And look at what the subject matter is of our first skit. Yeah. We all, exactly. Well, you know, I mean, not, yeah. They're not I'm playing that in, in heavy rotation in Sunday school anytime soon. So, yeah. funny, funny story is that when we, when we got signed, uh, a lot of the lyrics in our first album are about the struggles of understanding yourself. So it's like the people like myself that are always looking for something to save them, whether it be uh, religion or whether it be a drug or whether it be whatever else. Right. So we're always searching, you know, we're the sheep, we're the easy ones to just be like, Oh, this is going to be the thing I need. And so a lot of my lyrics were like, what is happening? What is this about? What is that about? So certain songs I say, Lord, I need you now, or like, you know, I remember I, I bought I, my first 12 Stones album at an Evangel bookstore. Right. So that, that's where I'm going with this. <laughs> there you right? go. So all, <laughs> yeah. all my lyrics were like about questioning yourself and religion and finding your own self. And that's kind of the underlying thought of all 12 Stones music, at least now in hindsight, is that like, it's about being your own self. It's a finding out who you are and being that, you know, it's about realizing that nobody's got a free walk in life. We all have adversity at all levels, you know, some worse than others, all those type of things. But like, so all of our lyrics were no cursing, very positive, uh, mm -hmm. a lot of religious undertones and the record label saw that as a way to make money. So yeah, exactly. Our, drum, our drummer at the time was atheist. So <laughs> we're, we're now being presented as a Christian band for, for some other people to make money off of because mm -hmm. the market was so much smaller than the secular market. Right. So just for, just for like a uh, simple math sake, we would be on a tour with like three doors down or Creed or one of these big arena tours where we were first band on the bill. We probably made 250 bucks a night to play these big arenas. Then we would get booked on a, a Christian festival and they would they would offer us like 20 grand right it's, to come it's play insane. an hour yeah and i'm like what like we <laughs> could go play two christian festivals and pay for tour the whole year yeah but we were just going where we were told we were guided through these things so we got used to that you know obviously it, it became yeah, like, you look at like the switchfoot boys too like they got labeled a christian band they're you know, they're not a Christian band by any means. Right. And hanging out with John and his brother, it's like, dude, we're some of us are Christians, but we're just a rock band. And there's a hell of a lot more money in the Christian scene than there is in the secular scene. So yeah. Right. And and it's 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 it's, it's all allowed them the to do what they're doing now. So right. I and mean, the thing that frustrated me the whole time is that we as the band got pigeonholed into this Christian market so that uh, we we were alienated out of a lot of fan bases. Because people automatically have a stigma. It's like, oh, you're a Jesus Bible thumping band. And I'm like, dude, you didn't even listen to a single word I've said. You didn't listen to a single lyric. You didn't listen to a single riff. You just you just read some idiot's article that says Christian band, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden, no, we're not cool. We're not 
we're not in with it. I'm like, dude, that's fine. I can, I can deal with that. But when we went to do our second album, uh, in our thank yous and our liner notes, Eric put, uh, we used to call our friends the RSAs, the rock stars by association. You know, they had our, our core little group of friends that did everything with us, you know? So he was like, yo, to all the RSAs, we love you so much. You kick ass. We were boycotted from Christian bookstores. Uh, there, there just this whole uproar because he said the word kick ass <laughs> in, in his thank yous. And we were boycotted from a, a bunch of major Christian bookstores. And then everybody kept now still to this day, I can't post like, Hey, what's your favorite color without someone being like, are you a Christian band? <laughs> it, blue. The answer was blue. I was going to go blue, you know? And so I have to say like, okay, well, in, in comparison, do you only hire Christian plumbers when you're, when your pipes bang up? Like, do you only hire the Lord's plumbers? Do you only eat Chick-fil-A, the Lord's chicken? I don't know. Like, why does it matter? Like, what I personally believe in my own personal relationship with religion or any other thing, what, what bearing does that have on the lyrics that I wrote about a darkest time in my life? Like, did you connect to it? Did it help you on a religious level? Then cool. Then I, I'm, I'm totally great with that. Did it help you on a non-religious level? Did you feel like you related to it in any way? Then that's, that's the reason I do what I do is not, not because I was put here by the Lord and I'm, being smite down if I don't do what I'm told. I I try to just share my story and be real with people and, and be transparent. You know, I struggle every day. I got my own insecurities, my own issues, and and I, and I just fight through it. And I don't like when I'm made to be I'm put in a category because of something that's none of your business. Well, you your know, should reserve the right to interpret the lyrics that you write into their own lives. I mean, that's, that's sure. why we do it. We, we do it to express ourselves. Sure. But the best songs can have different, you know, interpretations, you know, I mean, hell our song 18 days, that was a huge hit. That wasn't written initially for the military. It was written because Buford Pusser that the sheriff, uh, the, the movie walking tall is about, said in in critical condition when he took the bandages off his face he'd been in a coma for 18 days and in his in his life's tales he said it's been 18 days since i had to look at myself and we're like wow that's a killer lyric we shaped a whole love story around it. military grabbed onto it now we're on an aircraft carrier shooting a video for the military and it's like but what happened with that was because we were all open to how it went down it be began this very fruitful relationship with us and all the divisions of the military. And had we not been open-minded on both sides of the fence, that never would have happened. We were just trying to make a song, you know, and, and an interpretation led to this amazing thing because we were open-minded enough to see it for what it was. I always saw uh, back in the day when people would always ask us like, hey, what's this song about? And, and I saw an interview with Eddie Vedder years and years ago where someone asked him that same question. He said, well, what's it about to you? And they kind of answered a short question. And he said, well, that's what it's about. So like, I'm never going to steal. I'm never going to steal your ideas of like what you relate to a song. You know what I mean? Some people might relate it to like a, a relationship with a, a significant other. Some people might think of it as like a spiritual relationship. You know, it, it's never for me to say, I can, I can tell you like through the lyrics kind of where I was in my life when that song was writing, but I'm never going to tell you like the black and white, because then the second I do that, your, your whole thing, you might've shaped around a song. is like, Oh damn. All right. So like art is subjective. I want people to get out of 12 stones music, what they can out of it. If it's, if it's just good, high energy, fun and having a good time at a live show. Awesome. If you, you can sit there and relate and kind of feel like you're in that same room that I was in when I wrote it and man, that that's powerful. And that's, that keeps me motivated to continue sharing my story in hopes that if just one person hears it and can relate, then, then I feel like I've accomplished something. Well said, dude. That's awesome. Yeah. So it's, uh, you know, back to the food. I'm a foodie as in I'm a fat dude that likes to eat it. Um, Hey, I, I, well, I, and I am down. So, you know, Scott, congrats on your, uh, on your 45, how much more you got to go? We'll go health for you real quick. Leave it where it goes. I'm just trying to 
trying to get healthy. I've always been a larger mammal, so I'm just going to keep going till it's till it's time to stop. So I have a window that I want to be in. I'm 13 pounds from entering that window. Two months ago, I was 40 pounds from entering the window. And so I, I, but I mean, it's just staying active. I'm not doing anything besides, you know, counting, not counting, watching carbs and trying to stay active. But I love cooking, love barbecuing, love grilling, love cooking. Uh, what's your favorite thing to cook, Paul? I mean, we got Chef Scott over there. He, uh, he made a pot roast. He sent me a picture of not too long ago that was freaking phenomenal. What's your favorite thing to cook? Man, I'm a I'm a comfort food guy, so I'm oh, a I mean, you know, seasonings and butters goes a long way with me. I like to get creative with it, so I'd say probably of all the restaurants I've worked in, uh, kitchen manager, three different restaurants, um, pasta is probably my go to. I love a saute station, man. You get me on a saute station with eight <laughs> skillets, I'm slinging them like a beast. I promise you. Nice. Yes, yes, yes. That's my chef, Bartlett, cowboy. Bartlett was cooking some tortilla soup yeah. the other night, and then, like, he kept calling me and telling me about it. And I'm like, you asshole. I don't even like soup, but I want some. <laughs> <laughs> right. So my, wa- my wife made a jalapeno tomato bisque three nights ago. That was Ooh. Freaking phenomenal, dude! That and a mm. grilled cheese sandwich with some ham on it. She made grilled cheese with sprouts, so I do grilled cheese. Throw some alfalfa sprouts on it. Yes, see, I throw I throw onions and tomatoes in my grilled cheese. Oh, dude! And then uh, the best. The, the next business is going to be a grilled cheese food truck. By the way, <laughs> there's a million of them. Uh, yeah, I want to. I want to do a wrap food truck. That's what I was going to do before I started doing this. I was going to uh, go open up a food truck called That's a Wrap. And it's just going to be anything you could, anything you could roll up. Nice. I watched uh, the movie Chef, and I got inspired. I'm like, holy shit! I got to go do what this dude does. <laughs> yeah, I want a food truck bad. That's that's yeah. my, I think so down I, the road goal for me. I bought a food truck once. You bought a food truck? I did. Me and four partners, and I had this thing. Actually, me and McManus of all people. All really? <laughs> start a company. You know, sausage and cheese plates, like it, like yeah. barbecue. You know. Nobody ever thought to put that on a bun. What? So it was open, and and we named it the Bronson. It was going to be called the Beale Street Bronson. And then there were off of it, you know, like you could make one really spicy with, like, habanero coleslaw on it and call it the Don Bronson Miami Spice. Nice, dude. dude. Offshoots. And, I mean, we had the truck. The truck had all Viking guts. We just all got to get together one of these days and just go on a just a, a food venture just like go hit up like food trucks and just eat food and make videos of how awesome the food is film it yep I'm there. yes. there's a there. I mean, jamie and i base our vacations around eating so and that's, that's not a joke. That's, that's not a joke like we <laughs> went on a right after i quit my job uh we went on a three-week vacation uh just said screw it and it's just can't take it with you let's just go live it up for a couple weeks and we went out to uh, L.A. Then we went to Laguna Beach. We went on a cruise. We went to Vegas. Ended up running into Scott in Vegas, and uh, every bit of it was food. Every like we did a, Actually, a crazy Paul, VIP. Jesse knows Scott Altman. I introduced both y'all to Scott Altman. Uh, right on. Yeah. So Scott's my host. I uh, I was at a tech convention last week, which was a waste of time. But anyways. Um, <laughs> You know, Scott, I get hooked. I I play. And so it's, you know, I had quite a bit of food and beverage credit left for my last night because I ate at the convention like I had all of it left. And so I'm like, huh, let's go see how much how expensive of a dinner one person can possibly get. And so I uh, I went to a steakhouse at Mandalay Bay and it was 300, a little over 300 for the meal. And it was surf and turf, you know, Wagyu eight ounce and then a, a half lobster. And they brought me out some duck fat fries that I didn't nice. order because they were just awesome people and then had shrimp scampi. And I just freaking phenomenal. I That's love it. Do it. I love Scott. You're, you're heading to Vegas soon, right, bud? I'm actually heading out Sunday. Um, I wanted to kind of blow it out before before we get into tour mode because once it you know i've kind of committed to this like once the tour hits i'm just going to spend my summer being sort of like diligent and being you know like i told paul you know i'm not gonna i'm not ready for full-on sobriety but i think he's gonna like probably 
kind of make me want to not drink as much and made me want to <laughs> be healthier in general. So I feel like my quality of life is going to be good, but I'm going to be hard on myself for those two months to make sure I do what I can to be healthy this summer. Well, and you, and, you, that's not the first time you've mentioned it. You, uh, you told me a few months ago that this might be coming. Yeah. I mean, I, I just, you know, when it comes to me and the sobriety thing, I've always said if one of two things happen. One, I make enough of a jackass of myself to where I just can't come back from it. I got to just stop because my dad did not raise that person. And two, if I have like a tremendous health scare with regards to like a liver or something like that, I've never been a drinker or, or a drugger. I've been a ferocious drinker most of my adult life. I've just always said those are my two criteria. And somehow I'm still lovable by many when I drink. So I'm OK there. And my liver is still okay, but I just feel like that timeline has to be diminishing. And I, I don't I, know, man. Like I stopped like completely drinking three years ago. Like I, I realized one day, like I'm drinking just to be around people, and I'm like, that's a problem. And uh, so I, I just stopped. And I like health wise, like fitness wise, I feel great. Health wise, the health stuff is it, Jesse knows it's up and down, and there's been some scary situations. But and I think if I had kept drinking though, I'd probably be dead. I think like, so too. Just with uh, with what I've gone through and stuff. So, I mean, it's, you went through. I mean, can, can we talk a little bit about it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, Nick went through some vertebrae stuff. Had to have surgery, spine stuff. Uh, yeah, different, different spine fluid that was leaking at one point, and so everything that alcohol would have turned deadly if he would have been on it. <laughs> and so it's you know he was he was a a fall or a trip away of being paralyzed or breaking his neck. Yeah, and it's crazy, man. It's yeah. crazy how that, I, how I still that have works. fluid leaking, which sucks. So I still get like really bad headaches and like exhaustion. That, like so that's the hardest part is the exhaustion. Like I'll be good for a couple hours, and then all of a sudden it'll hit me like a ton of bricks, and I have to. I'm in bed for like two or three days. I uh, I I don't have a drinking problem. I do drink. I don't drink often. It's uh, for me. It's one to two cocktails a month, and so I mean, yeah, I, yeah, I mean, I, you, I know you're not. You don't drink. No, right. And so I know people are looking at my glass cup, but my glass cup is full of Snapple Zero. <laughs> my so, dog. Dude, I remember like one of the, so I was hanging out with Gavin DeGraw, like, God, it must been like 15 years ago. Okay. He's playing this place called Brit in Jacksonville, Oregon. And we started early in the morning and basically went up until his show. He gets up and he's, he's, this is when One Tree Hill was huge. He's got the theme song on One Tree Hill. He goes to perform the theme song from One Tree Hill and forgets the words. That was awesome. I was, and then thanks me. <laughs> so we uh, we are at that wrap up point. We need to cut this thing so I can get it edited. So we can go same day grind lifestyle people. So you know this is our first same day release. We're gonna edit Crazy. this in the next hour. We're gonna kick this thing out. Uh, you'll obviously already know that because you're gonna be watching when it comes out. Uh, Paul, what do you think about joining us again? Maybe we can get you. And Scott to do a part two while you're I'm on the road. Yeah, Together. I'm down. I'm down. You know where to find me. I'll be next to that lovable man right there. For Love him. Uh, Scott and I have become pretty close. I can't wait to meet you in person. I'm sure that day's coming. Um, as always, if there's anything I can do to assist you guys, just let me know. Uh, final questions from anybody before we wrap this up. Nick, you want to go first? I'm good, man. I, I asked my questions. Scott, you got anything? I'm good too, man. Oh, wait, actually, oh. real quick, we got a text from Paul. He just joined Planet Fitness. So while they're on the road, I challenge you guys, hit up Planet Fitnesses while you're out on the road, get some footage, and we'll have a little competition. All right. I have to tell you guys, though, like I said before, I'm I'm, I'm a maniac and I'm 100 miles an hour or nothing. So I saw y'all posting about Planet Fitness and posting y'all's fitness journey every day, and I Joined Planet Fitness from my couch. I went yesterday. I did three and a half miles, hour cardio, walking uphill. I'm coming for you, boys. I'm uh, I'm uh, I'm gonna try to shred this uh, this oh, little, uh on, the, on that note. Oh, oh look at that. Uh -oh, uh, uh -oh. On that note, if you go to Scott Bartlett Official <laughs> on YouTube, you can see week one of Scott's journey that is a couple months old. We had some meta hiccups that are now way behind us. So Tomorrow, the entire week two is releasing. Monday, the entire week three is releasing. Wednesday, the entire week four. So we'll be caught up in about two weeks. What do you say? We, 
weeks I'm on now. I think I'm at like half a year almost. In, in about two weeks, I'll be caught up to Scott's biceps as well, too. Yeah. <laughs> so, hey, go check it out. Make sure you hit like and subscribe. I'm sure since these guys are going to be on the road together, you'll see some of Paul shredding and pushing Scott. You know, Scott, I don't know if Scott's going to be able to hang with Paul if Paul's going to bring the energy that he says he's bringing. I don't know. It seems like an open challenge there, Bartlett. Oh, he's hey, four well. years than me and those are pretty important years so i'm just gonna try to hang on <laughs> and way better looking man i gotta tell you i'm a, I'm a good looking son of a bitch you know what i'm saying <laughs> nah, i'm just playing um but yeah we're gonna we're gonna do it right i don't do any weightlifting though so uh this i know it's hard to see from the camera but uh i don't really bulk up uh in the right spot so i'm gonna just lose it i'm just gonna shred weight and y'all can get bulky and you know oh, rub yeah. biceps or whatever oh yeah i'll just you know, so Scott's uh, Scott's Facebook handle is bottom left. His Instagram handle is bottom right. Do us a favor, hit that like, subscribe, and share button. Help us grow this grind lifestyle brand. It's been taking off. Every video we've posted has at least two thousand views on it right now for an entry startup podcast. That's phenomenal. Let's keep it rolling. Scott Paul, do great on the tour. We got uh, we got your back. Anything you need from us. I am Jesse Dugas. That is Nick Martin. That is Scott Bartlett. And that is Paul McCoy. Until next time. Thanks, guys. Right.